Terumae Romae is a Japanese manga by Mari Yamazaki. The story follows a bathhouse architect, Lucius, from Rome during the time of Emperor Hadrian. Each chapter of the manga starts with Lucius being tasked to build a bathhouse and him accidentally time traveling to modern day Japan where he learns and receives influence on the bath technology and culture. At the end of the chapter, we see how Lucius executes these Japanese bath ideas in a Roman style. So yeah, it's a time traveling Roman bath architect. <laughs> Which sounds crazy, but it is an amazing manga. There are six volumes of the manga released between 2008 and 2013. A flash anime adaptation was made in 2012, however, more popular was the two live action films released in 2012 and 2014, featuring a number of very famous Japanese actors. It's a very light and comedic manga, but also a fun way to learn Roman history. So I've decided to fact check Terumai Romai and its historical accuracy. First, the title The Latin word Thermae comes from the Greek word thermos, which means hot. Therme usually refer to large imperial bath complexes. There's also another word, balne, which refers to bathing facilities, usually of a smaller scale. The title of the manga, Therme Rome, is pronounced in the Japanese style, Terumae Romae, translating to Roman baths. Chapter 1. We start in 128 AD Rome. Hadrian has been emperor since 117 AD and we meet our main character, Lucius Modestus. Lucius is not only a name for dark wizards, but also was a very common name back in ancient Rome. The name originating from the Latin word lux, meaning light. Modestus is also a name from late Rome, meaning moderate and restrained. This surname suits our main character as he is shown throughout the manga to be a very humble and modest man. Anyways, in the first scene, we see Lucius get laid off by one of his clients, being told that his designs are too old-fashioned and that they need an architect with more modern designs. Emperor Hadrian was known as a lover of art and architecture, and during his reign contributed much to Rome's architectural legacy, most famously the Pantheon, which was completed in 125 AD. So there was a heightened interest in architectural innovation at the time. Lucius, after being fired, runs into one of his friends, Marcus, who tells him to cheer up and come to the bath with him to relax. In ancient Rome, an average Roman citizen would start working at sunrise and work throughout the morning. Then in the early afternoon, maybe around 1 or 2, they would get off work, have lunch, and then head to the bathhouse to work out and bathe. Wow, that sounds like a nice schedule. Now you might be imagining a peaceful spa with beautiful marble statues and mosaic tiles. And certainly aesthetically, these were luxuriously decorated places, but I would not say a Roman bath would be like a modern day spa. We see that the bathhouse is full of men wrestling and playing games, vendors selling snacks and offering waxing. This is all true. Bathhouses were kind of a multifunctional space. You might have an outdoor courtyard for exercising and spaces for people to sell food, perfume, and other necessities. They also functioned as a branch library where you could borrow books and read in the reading rooms. In some of the fancier ones, you might even find a stage where plays were sometimes performed. The philosopher Seneca used to live above a public bath and he described the experience as being extremely loud. He would complain about the sound of weightlifters grunting and the splashing of swimmers, and people shouting and advertising their waxing services. Lucius is clearly not a fan of this hectic environment, and dives underwater to get some peace and quiet. Underwater, he senses a current, and is dragged into a whirlpool, and emerges not in the Roman bath, but in a modern Japanese bathhouse. He looks behind him and sees a mosaic of Mount Fuji on the wall, and exclaims, It's Mount Vesuvius of Pompeii which had already erupted in 79 AD, before Lucius was even born. And then he sees the other people around him, whom he calls the Hiratai Kaozoku, meaning flat-faced people. He believes that he must have accidentally slipped into a public bath for the slaves. Slaves were an important part of the bathhouse ecosystem, as many wealthy individuals would bring their slaves to attend to them in the bath. And in fact, the majority of bathhouses had three separate entrances, one for men, one for women, and one for the slaves. Now, I couldn't find any sources that said slaves would have had a separate bathing area for themselves, but hygiene was important in ancient Rome, so slaves must have used the baths as well. And the bathhouses were very reasonable, and sometimes even free. In attempts to gain popularity, local politicians might fund the waiving of the entrance fees at certain bathhouses. 
Anyways, as Rome was constantly conquering new territories, Lucius simply believed that these people must be from the farther reaches of the empire. Now, if you take a look at the map of Roman territory during the time of Hadrian, it doesn't stretch that far east, so Romans probably never would have seen an East Asian person before. But there have been a few Asian skeletons found in ancient Roman burial grounds. Two skeletons were found in Londinium, present-day London, and were believed to have been buried sometime between the 2nd and 4th century. And we're not sure if these people were slaves, merchants, or maybe even diplomats, but technically the Roman Empire did host a diverse group of people. And Lucius is impressed by their artisanship. The large, high-quality, one-panel mirror is something that Lucius is obsessed with. Mirrors were a thing in Rome, but they were usually just polished pieces of metal, like bronze. And generally, they were small, handheld mirrors for ladies to hold while putting on their makeup. Lucius starts to panic, and the old men try to figure out a way to calm him down. They offer him a bottle of fruit milk. It's common in Japan to drink milk after a bath, with varieties such as coffee milk, strawberry milk, and fruit milk available. After taking a sip, Lucius wakes up and realizes he is back in Rome, but the empty bottle of fruit milk is still by his side. At the end of the chapter, we see that Lucius has built a new bath inspired by the Japanese bath he saw. So far, this story is doing great in terms of historical accuracy. They set up the Roman lifestyle really well and the atmosphere is totally correct. So let's see how we do in chapter 2. It's 129 AD and Lucius is at a bar drinking when he is approached by a messenger with a message from consul Lepidus. Now, in 129 AD, the two consuls were Lucius Neratius Marcellus and Publius Juventius Celsus. So neither of them were named Lepidus. The most famous consul named Lepidus was Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, who was consul in 78 BC and died in 77 BC. So this Lepidus is totally a fictional character. Lucius is asked to design a bath for Lepidus's second home in Campania. When Lucius visits, Lepidus is an old, sickly man. Lepidus tells Lucius that he saw Lucius's bath featuring a wall with Mount Vesuvius and wanted an outdoor bath since his home has a great view of the actual mountain. Traditionally, baths were always contained indoors. However, there were and still are many natural hot springs in Italy where you could have an outdoor bathing experience. These features, of course, being more abundant near tectonic activity. And Lepidus claims that the hot spring near his house formed after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Anyways, Lucius decides to enter the water to check it out. And when he opens his eyes, he realizes that there are wild monkeys bathing with him. The snow monkeys of Japan are known to be the only primates except us that frequently use baths. This is actually a relatively recent phenomenon, with the first reported sighting in the 1950s, when a group of monkeys started to use the outdoor baths at hotels in Nagano. With hygiene concerns of humans and monkeys sharing a bath, in the 1960s a new facility was made to have outdoor baths just for monkeys. Anyways, Lucius is asked to leave the monkey bath and is pointed towards the human bath. There he is offered some sake, and an egg. This is called an onsen tamago, and it's an egg that's been cooked in hot spring water, which gives it a unique coloring and flavor depending on the minerals in the water. Lucius returns to his own time and builds Lepidus his bath. It's a shame that in the chapter they decided to use a fictional consul, but Lepidus isn't a recurring character. He only really shows up in chapter 2, so I guess it's not such a big deal. Let's see what happens in chapter 3. It's 1.30 AD, and we meet Lucius's friend Marcus building sculptures of a young man. We're told this is Antinous, Hadrian's young Greek lover who died in October of 1.30. Antinous accompanied Hadrian on a trip to Egypt, which was a part of the Roman Empire. They were on the Nile when Antinous died, supposedly, of drowning. However, there were rumors that this was not an accidental drowning, but rather a suicide. Some rumors even said that Antinous was used as a human sacrifice. Anyways, Hadrian was devastated after this event. Hadrian deified Antinous and founded a cult to worship him. That's the reason why Marcus is making all of these statues, so that they can be shipped around to the cult of Antinous across the empire. Marcus's stonemason master comes out to ask him to take him to the bath, for he is too old to go on his own. He wished that he'd had a private bath in his own home, which at the time only the wealthy were able to afford. In the bath, the master loses his strigil in the water. A strigil is this hooked-shaped tool which was used to clean the body. Before bathing, you would apply oils to your body and massage it in. 
Then you would use the streusel to scrape that oil off with all of the dirt and sweat that came with it. So Lucius offers to go and retrieve it, when yet again he slips into modern day Japan. Lucius pops up from a bathtub and finds himself in a typical Japanese bathroom, which is split into two sections, the bathtub and the washing area. The bathtub usually has a lid on it to keep the water warm. It also serves to keep soap and dirt out of the bath while the individual is using the washing area. People generally sit down and thoroughly wash their bodies before entering the bathtub. An old man enters the bathroom and believes that Lucius must be his helper for the day. In 2015, 19,000 Japanese people died in the bath. Whether that be from slipping and falling or from heart attacks triggered by extreme temperature change. So it's not uncommon for elderly people in Japan to get professional assistance while bathing. The old man puts a plastic halo around his head, which Lucius believes to be a crown. It's actually something frequently used by children to keep soap and water out of the face while washing hair. Lucius returns to his time and builds the stonemason master his personal bath. When the officials come to Marcus to collect all of the statues that he built, they see the private bath and are highly impressed. At the end of the chapter, we see Hadrian, who is in Alexandria, Egypt, declare that he must return to Rome to meet this bath architect. Chapter 4. It's 131 AD. And we are at Hadrian's villa in Tivoli. It's actually still there. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Hadrian supposedly disliked the palace on Palatine Hill, and by 128 AD started to use the villa in Tivoli as his official residence, and from there he ruled the entire empire. The villa itself is a mix of many different architectural styles, and Hadrian took inspiration from all corners of the empire. The manga mentions one of the most fascinating features of the villa, called the Maritime Theater. The space consists of a ring-shaped pool on a central island. This was thought to have been Hadrian's private place, where he would go and relax after a day of work. In the manga, Hadrian says that those who cross the bridge onto his island without his permission are punished. But Lucius is invited by the emperor himself to join him on the private island, and is asked to make a small bath that can fit into the space. Hadrian says to Lucius, you must know that I am hated by the senate. Unlike his predecessor, Trajan, Hadrian was not interested in expanding the empire. He felt unification was a much more important task. He personally visited almost every province of the empire and invested in infrastructure that would help stabilize and defend the borders they already had. For example, Hadrian's Wall in Northern Britain. Hadrian tells Lucius that he will be traveling to Jerusalem next month in order to deal with some riots happening in Judea. He asks for a bath to be built immediately immediately so that he has a space to relax and think deeply on how to solve this problem. It's true that there were major revolts in Judea during Hadrian's reign, and in the next chapter we will learn more about that. But for now, Lucius has one question. What happened to Apollodorus? Apollodorus was a highly accomplished architect and engineer. He was Trajan's favorite architect and is credited with designing the Forum, Trajan's Column, as well as the Pantheon. However, supposedly Apollodorus offended Hadrian in some way, and Hadrian actually banished him. Now, in the manga, Hadrian just says that Apollodorus is too old and doesn't have any good ideas. So he was fired from his job as imperial architect. Lucius accepts the job to build a bath for the emperor. But of course, before he can get started, he time travels to modern day Japan. It's 2009 and we are in Shinjuku, Tokyo. We meet a young girl working at a bathroom showroom. This is probably based on the very famous Toto showroom in Shinjuku. Anyways, the manager comes and tells her that she's in charge of taking care of the Italian customer that is coming later. The girl is nervous as she doesn't speak any English or Italian when Lucius pops up from the bath. Although initially suspicious, she believes that this must be the Italian customer that she needs to take care of. She shows him many different bath models, including those with a television embedded in the wall. Lucius somehow manages to communicate that he needs to use the bathroom. Lucius is introduced to the super high-tech Japanese toilet. Toilets in ancient Rome were pretty sophisticated for their time. 
underneath public toilets, water would be constantly flowing in order to flush away the excrements. And instead of toilet paper, they used something called a tersorium, which was kind of like a toilet brush for your butt. It would be a piece of sea sponge attached to the end of a stick. Romans would use this to wipe themselves and then rinse it in running water or a bucket of vinegar or salt water and leave it for the next person to use. Anyways, the girl is waiting outside the bathroom for Lucius to come out when she realizes that he had disappeared. Lucius, back in his timeline, impresses the emperor with his innovative ideas. Hadrian invites Lucius to join him on the trip to Jerusalem, and the guards snicker outside that Hadrian has found himself a new lover. Chapter 5. It's 134 AD and we are in Judea. We are in the middle of the Bar Kokhba revolt, triggered by the construction of the new city, Aelia Capitolina, which was pretty much built on the ruins of Jerusalem. We see Emperor Hadrian and General Sextus Julius Severus at the military camp. Severus was actually the governor of Britain before he was asked to move to Judea to help suppress the revolt. Severus was a very capable general and was often sent to unstable parts of the empire to help bring peace to the region. However, this will be one of the most difficult revolts to suppress. Hadrian examines the coins that are being issued by the rebels. These coins were made by scraping off the original designs of Roman coins, which would have had Hadrian's portrait on it, and reminted with phrases like freedom to Jerusalem. They also discuss how the rebels took down an entire legion by poisoning their wine, which it seems like this actually happened. The emperor suggests for the physical health of the soldiers, as well as to boost their morale, a bath should be built. And amazingly, there really was a Roman bath built in Aelia Capitolina in 135 AD, specifically for the 10th legion that was garrisoned there after suppressing the revolt. And of course, in the manga, Lucius is the one tasked to design this bath. He is unhappy that the construction of the bath is behind schedule when he slips in to modern day Japan. He finds himself in a bathhouse full of people with major injuries. There's a belief in Japan that the minerals in hot springs can help heal injuries. Some even going so far as to say that it can help heal cancer. Anyways, there are certain baths that really specialize in this healing property. We see that the place Lucius ends up also has an ondo. This is a traditional Korean technique of underfloor heating. And lying on this heated floor is also used as a form of healing. Lucius returns to Rome to implement these ideas. He is thanked by the emperor and is finally given permission to return to Rome to see his wife. At this point, Lucius had been away from Rome for three years. So he returns home to find that his wife Livia had left him. And that's the end of book one. After all the awesome historical drama that unfolded, it's kind of funny that they use this very personal drama as the final cliffhanger. So will Lucius get his wife back in book two? I guess you'll find out in my next review. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.